Amen. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to uh, the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. It's a little book in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, it's about two-thirds of the way through your Bible probably uh, is where you're going to find it. If, if it helps, it's right after the book of Obadiah. Is that, is that, is that a big help? I, I thought so. Hey, if you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have a clue where Jonah is, grab one of the Bibles and the seats around you, turn to page 920, and you will find the book of Jonah. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of these with you, because we want you to have the Bible. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, uh, how, many, how many in this room like to run? Let me, let me see your hands. How many runners we got? Okay. Not, not as many as I, as I thought. Okay, how many of you uh, run even if you don't like it? <laughs> oh, we got hands that went up there too. Okay. All right, let's, let's get down, uh, you know, how many of you have ever run a 5K? Okay, more hands went up than a runner's in the room. Okay, it tells me something. Okay, how many half marathoners in here? How many of you have done that? Oh, there's some hands that go up. Okay. Marathons? Any, anybody finish? Oh, okay. More, there's runners in this room. You know, I, I'm, I'm impressed. I, I, you know, I don't understand you, but I'm impressed. Okay? Uh, I mean, I, I pray God's blessings on you, but I'm way more biblical than that. You know, Proverbs 28.1 says, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. <laughs> but the righteous are bold as a lion. I'm just, uh, you know, you have to go to obscure translations to get that out of that one. Uh, I'm just telling you that. That's the New Living Translation. The ESV says the wicked flee when no one's chasing them. But anyway, uh, uh, look, I re I re if you're a runner, I respect you tremendously. I don't understand you, but I respect you. I, tr I tried to run. Kind of like I tried Brussels sprouts. <laughs> tried it, didn't like it, decided I wouldn't do it again. Uh, but I, I can run if I'm distracted. So if I'm playing basketball or tennis, uh, you know, I can run because I don't realize I'm running. Uh, and, you know, and, and I can run if somebody's chasing me. But, uh, you know, because if you see me running, then, then something's wrong. You got to run too. But, uh, but if I'm not being chased, I'm not going to run. It just isn't going to happen, uh, at least physically. Because running isn't just physical, is it? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's the physical health part, we run, but a lot of us, well, we're, we run even though we don't run. You know, we run from responsibilities, we run from relationships, sometimes we run from commitment or conflict, sometimes, uh, you know, we're told to run. Scripture says, flee youthful lusts. Sometimes we run from pain or fear or embarrassment. I'm pretty sure that all of us in this room at some point have run from God. It may have been brief, it may have been decades, but we've all kind of run from God. And today we're beginning a series about a guy named Jonah who's famous for running. Now, that's only part of the story, and if that's the only part of the story you know, then you're going to really like this series. But Really, Jonah was famous for running from God, but more specifically, Jonah ran from his mission. Jonah ran from his mission. We're going to look at chapter one today. Guess how many weeks the series is going to last. Uh, there's four chapters of Jonah, in case you didn't know that. So chapter one, I'm just going to read the story. You, a lot of you know this. If you, get, if you grew up going to Sunday school or vacation Bible school, you heard uh, you know, the story of Jonah over and over and over again. It, but if you're kind of new to this church stuff, then this story is like really cool and really just wild and weird. So anyway, uh, people say the Bible's boring. They don't read it. So here we go. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. 
Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from and what is your country and of what people are you? And Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. What a wild story, isn't it? God called Jonah, who was a prophet, Somebody who spoke for God, somebody who listened to God, somebody who represented God to people and God's word to people. God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Now, uh, Nineveh was the capital city of a, an empire called the Assyrians that dated to the 8th and 7th century B.C. In fact, they were uh, widely known in history for their extreme cruelty. And uh, they were the empire that was responsible for the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. In 722 B.C., they conquered the city, capital city of Samaria and, and took the people in exile and brought new people in, which is why the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. And, and so uh, the Assyrians were hated by everybody. Everybody. So uh, Jonah didn't want to go and preach to a city full of people that he hated, that he saw as political enemies, and, and he actually kind of wanted their destruction. Uh, he wanted to see God's judgment fall on Nineveh. So when God said, Jonah, I want you to go and preach to these people and warn them of my anger, warn them of the, of the judgment to come, Jonah said, nope, not going to do it. And he ran from the mission that God gave him. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ... If, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, you have a mission. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have a mission. It's every bit as clear and plain as the mission that God gave Jonah. Uh, at least it's written down in black and white for us. I mean, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. He had to hear it. We can read it. We can pick it up and look at it. How about Jesus? You know, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus said, Hey, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So if you're sitting here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you know that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, then you have the power of God in your life and you're on a mission to be the witness for Jesus. Or how about the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, what's often called the Great Commission, where he looked at his disciples and he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And guess what? I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm just, I'm just going to be with you while you're doing this, making disciples of all the nations. Or how about... The Apostle Peter, 
1 Peter 2, 9, where he says, but you, again, talking to believers, talking to the church, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what's our mission? It's to be the witnesses of Jesus to the world. It's to make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching. It, it is to tell people how God has changed your life. That you once were a person of darkness and now you're a person of light. See, God gave us a mission. Just as clear as he gave it to Jonah. And, and so if you're a follower, you belong to God and and God wants you to tell people how he's changed your life. That's why at Calvary, we just described the mission this way. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That, that's what we're all about. But we want you to know that this mission is first to family. It is first of all to family. The, in other words, the priority place of influence that God calls each of us to is our families. Yeah, sometimes he sends us to geographical locations like Jonah. Hey, I want you to go to Nineveh. But when he does that, he usually makes it really, really clear. But he always wants us to be those witnesses for Christ, the, the ones to make disciples, the ones to you know, proclaim the glories of God who called us out of darkness into his light, first and foremost, in our homes. See, I want, I want all of y'all, that's a, that's a phrase, all of y'all to follow Jesus Christ. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to love Jesus. I want you to serve Jesus. Um, I want everybody I meet to, to know Jesus and to love Jesus and to follow Jesus and to serve Jesus, okay? I, I, that's just my, that's my heart's desire. But I want my family, first and foremost, to know God and to love God and to follow Jesus and to serve him. That, that's just my heart. It's not, it's not saying I don't care about you or I don't want you to do that, but that's where it begins. And, and, and so I want them to have that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And guess what? God calls you to that same task. That mission begins at home. To, to embrace that divine calling of God to influence those closest to you to radically love Jesus. That, that's where the, the first calling of Christ begins. And, and so here's the thing. If, if you've got kids or grandkids in our family ministries, we want your children, we want your teenagers, we want your spouses to love Jesus like crazy. Okay? We're, we're, we're unapologetic about that. That's our goal is to get them to love Jesus like crazy. And we do that knowing that it won't happen unless mom and dad radically love Jesus. That's the reality of it. Uh, I'm just going to be blunt. The number one influencing factor in children embracing faith as adults is the active, healthy faith of their parents. Number one influencing factor on a child's faith life going from children to adulthood is the active, authentic faith of their parents. Which means... If you're being hypocritical, you're probably harming your kid's faith. Not saying that you got to be perfect, because none of us are, but you got to be authentic in your love and devotion for God. Are we being authentic in our love and our devotion for God so that our spouse is influenced, so that our kids are influenced, so that our grandkids are influenced, so that our friends are influenced with the gospel? Hey, let me give you just some questions. Do you practice what you preach? Do your stated values match the way you live your life? Do your children ever see you read your Bible? Ever hear you pray? Ever see you ask forgiveness or serve people? I guess it really boils down to this. Parents, do you want good kids? Or do you want kids who love Jesus? Because there's a difference. And sometimes we're just tempted to, to we just want good kids. 
stay out of trouble, you know, and, and graduate high school and get a good job and be decent people. And, and that's not enough. Because if you really want them to experience the power of God in their lives, you got to encourage them to radically love Jesus. So our mission is first to our families, to lead them to faith. That's where this faith life begins. If it's not happening in the home, it's really not going to translate anyplace else. So first of all, our mission is to our families, and then, and then we have a mission to the community. See, it begins in our homes, but we live in a community. And, and so Lake Havasu City is our community. And right now, there's about 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. About 40,000 people that if you talk to them, they don't have a church they regularly go to. They might have been raised in something, but they haven't been in years. 40,000 people who, who can't call on the name of the Lord like you. They can't, you know, uh, don't have that relationship that, that they can say that Jesus changed my life. And this is our mission field. This is where God has sent us. You go, I don't feel sent to have a suit. Are you living here? Then, then God sent you here. Might have been against your will. It might have been, uh, you know, not your plans. Doesn't really matter. You're here and you're a witness for Jesus Christ. And he said, begin where you live, Jerusalem. And so this is where we live. So this is our mission field. So we want to live as followers of Jesus Christ, representing Jesus in our homes first. But then we want to represent him at work. We want to represent him in our schools. We want to represent him in the restaurants we visit, in the sporting events we go to. We want to represent him on the lake. We want to represent him on social media. You see, this is the character piece. Because you can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. It's just not going to happen. So the way you treat people is going to make a difference on whether we're going to be effective in our mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Uh, see, the way we live is either going to draw people to Jesus or it's going to become an obstacle for people coming to Jesus. And of course, since we've been sent to our community as our mission field, we want to serve our community. We want to serve our community. That's, that's why we bless teachers and schools. That's why we serve on Main Street at Halloween. That's why we support the food bank, interagency food bank. By the way, right now we've been collecting food for the last month for the food bank. It's led by our Crusaders uh, Life Group and, and they're all about it. So if you want Bring food. This week is finishing it out. So, you know, bring some canned food, uh, you know, stuff that doesn't perish. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, that's why we support pregnancy care. By the way, we gave out baby bottles about a month ago. A lot of you took the baby bottles. We would like them back <laughs> with money in them. Okay, that was the point. You took it. You had good intentions. It's not so you can sit on your shelf and you go, look at that baby bottle. I need to do something with that. And if you don't have change, that's okay. They will take cash. If you don't have cash, that's okay. They will take a check. Just don't put your credit card in there. Uh, and, you know, but, uh, you know, that's why we serve that way. Hey, here's, here's some really cool news. Last year, 2017, Calvary invested $80,000 plus to improve our schools, feed families, and help people build their lives in our community. You guys did that. I know. See, I think that's worth celebrating. Somebody says to you, well, what difference does your church make? Say, hey, look, we, we put $80,000 back into our community to feed people and, and make our schools better for the kids and to bless the teachers and just do all this kind of stuff. It doesn't even count the baby bottles, just saying. <laughs> I think there's like $10,000 more that you guys gave through baby bottles, but we can't track that quite as clearly. So, so why do we do that? We, we do this so that we can love our neighbors and so that we can share the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Because we want you to go out into the community and live as witnesses for Jesus Christ because this is the mission that we've been called to and we're trying to help you do that by serving our neighbors so that you can share with them, hey, guess what? The reason we do this is because Jesus has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's changed our lives and we're new creations because of that and he can do the same thing for you. So we're on a mission to lead people in Lake Havasu City to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Who are you leading toward Jesus? Who are you leading toward Jesus? So we're on a mission to our families, to our community, and ending to the world. Right? Because Jesus said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. 
Calvary is committed to the uttermost parts of the earth. The majority of our mission dollars go beyond our community, go beyond our shores to uh, the, the world. So uh, again, you guys, as a church, last year, 2017, uh, we gave over $440,000 to mission causes. So I'm impressed with you guys. I don't know if you guys are or not, but I think that's pretty cool. Over $440,000. That's, you know, it's, this, this next year, it'll probably hit a half a million. And, uh, and here's, here's something I got today as, as news from um, our partnership with the missionaries in Mozambique. We gave to Wells. We've sponsored, I don't know how many Wells now it's up to. It's probably like about a dozen. And, and, and they put a well in at one of these locations. I, I can't name it. And they said this one location, they just put a well in, has already started two churches out of that. Tangible results because of your generosity is happening on the mission field in places most of you will never go and see, and yet lives are being changed because of that. See, I think that's cool. And by the way, we don't just send money, we send people. Yeah, we, we send people. We want you to go and serve. And we do that in the States too. We've got a, a student mission trip to Hawaii this summer. We've got a family trip to Idaho. But in August, uh, Jesse has taken a group to Japan to do some training for worship ministry so he could use some people, a couple of people who really want to work with kids and maybe do some crafts type things. So if you're interested in going to Japan on a mission trip in August, see Jesse. Uh, Pastor Chet is taking a group to Greece to work with uh, Muslim refugees in, in September. And so uh, it's a service trip, and I think it's full, but if, if you're interested, just check with Pastor Chet, and, and he can let you know. And then uh, I just committed this a couple of weeks ago, us, uh, to a trip to Kenya in October to go and take care of missionary kids while they're in meetings. And so I'm looking for some people who want to go, can't be a big group, like 8 to 10, that want to go and, and take care of kids so that missionaries can get ready to go back to their field and to serve in October. If you're interested in that, then just email me because we're going to be nailing down that group really soon. But, uh, but see, we, we've got people going and that's just in 2018. 2019, there's going to be other trips. Uh, and, uh, and here's the thing. We have a mission from Jesus. As a church, we're trying to help you fulfill your mission in your family, in your community, to the ends of the earth. That's what we're a part of. But here's the question that you need to struggle with. Are you moving toward the mission or away from it? Because Jonah knew his mission. It was clear to him. God had given it to him, and then he intentionally moved away from it. I want to get away from the presence of the Lord. I don't want to do this task. And so then we see the next thing about Jonah's life is that Jonah suffered the consequences of his rebellion. God gave him a mission, and he chose to reject it. And then because of that, Jonah suffered the consequences of his rebellion. Uh, he rebelled against God's calling, and let's face it, you know, he ended up as fish food. You know, didn't stay that way, but he, you know, he didn't know that. So here's a question that, that occurred to me as I'm writing this. Do you think Jonah would have rebelled against God if he knew where it led? Do you think if, if God had said, Jonah, if you run from me, I'm going to put you in the belly of a fish? For three days in the ocean, you're gonna, it's going to be, do you think, what do you think Jonah would have done? Do you think he would have said, I don't care, I'm going to go anyway? Or would he have gone, uh, okay, Nineveh sounds better now. See, he can say, I didn't know what was going to happen, so I just ran from God. But can I just tell you that when you run from what God has for you, it's never going to end well. Can, can I just tell you that? Because scripture tells us that. So what about us? I mean, if you know what's going to happen when you rebel against God, is it going to change your decision? If you know what's going to happen if you ignore God's calling and his mission, is, is that going to change your decisions? Because God tells us. He tells us where rebellion leads. In fact, uh, if you just read scripture over and over and over again, that message is clear. When you reject God, bad things happen to your life. But it's spelled out in black and white, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. The apostle Paul says, he's talking to church people, he's talking to Christians. He says, don't be deceived. Don't kid yourselves. God cannot be mocked. 
Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, he will from the flesh reap destruction. And if you sow to the Spirit, you from the Spirit, you'll reap eternal life. We will reap what we sow. There is no way around that. No way around it at all. We're going to reap what we sow. Um, so can I just encourage you not to lie to yourself? Rebellion against God never ends well. Never. It, it, it's not possible for it to end well. You, when you run away from God, it always results in pain, in sorrow, in, in disappointment. And in essence, we end up as fish food. It's just the inevitable outcome of our rebellious activity. And Jonah suffered the consequences of, re of his rebellion and, well, we're going to also. And so if you need a, a reason to obey God, if you need a reason to follow Jesus, if you need a reason to embrace his mission, then um, just understand that we're going to reap what we sow. And our rebellion's not going to end well. It's going to hurt. You're not going to get away with it. it you know, it's not going to make you happy. It's not going to bless you. On the other hand, following Jesus is. Following Jesus is going to lead you to joy. It is going to bless you. He is going to show up in your life. It's going to change your life for the better. Now, the other reason that you might want to consider uh, embracing the mission of Christ and obeying God is because we impact others by our rebellion. We impact others by our rebellion. Um, who did Jonah's rebellion impact besides Jonah? But the guys in the boat with him, right? I mean, the sailors, they, they kind of went through it, uh, scared them to death. Uh, the merchants, whoever had invested in the cargo on that ship, <laughs> it did not end well for them, did it? You know, hey, we're throwing this overboard because we want to live. We don't want to sink. Somebody lost a lot of money because of Jonah's rebellion. You see, he, he put people's lives at risk because he rejected God's mission. And, and then, you know, he caused them to violate their consciences because I love the fact that even though they were not God followers, they didn't want to throw him overboard, right? He's like, okay, the way to fix this is throw me overboard. And then they're like, nope, we're not going to do it. We're going to row harder. Until they couldn't. And they finally said, okay, God, forgive us for doing this. And, and they throw Jonah overboard. His actions impacted them. And here's the thing. Your rebellion, your sin impacts others. Always. It's going to impact others. Uh, you know, it's going to be destructive. It's going to be negative on their life. And, and by the way, it's a lie from hell that says, it's only hurting me. You know, the only way that it only hurts you is if you live in isolation. If you're in relationships with anybody, then your actions, your rebellion, your defiance towards God is going to hurt other people. It's going to hurt your spouse if you're married. It can't not hurt them. So many marriages have been destroyed from the inside by the supposedly harmless activity of pornography. Supposedly. It's going to hurt your kids and your grandkids. Your rebellion is going to hurt your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends. It's actually going to hurt the community. As your life is an influence. That's the reality. So who are you dragging into your storm of disobedience? Jonah put a ship full of sailors at risk. Who are your actions putting at risk? Who are your actions, you know, influencing so that, well, they don't want to know Christ. They don't want to follow. They don't want to go to church. They don't really want to believe. Because your life is going to impact others positively or negatively. Now, here's the cool part of the story. This is the good news. God redeems our rebellion. Right? Because Jonah was redeemed. Story continues. He blew it, but the story didn't end there. There is a chance for redemption. So you've got to stick around next week and find out how it turns out, right? But that's not the end of the story. Even though he rebelled, there's, there's a chance for redemption. God redeems our stories. And, and then here's the really cool part is out of our rebellion, God still redeems others. Did, did you catch what happened to the sailors 
after they threw Jonah overboard and the sea went calm instantly? They're like, wow, God is really cool. The God of the Hebrews, that's really the best God. Let's worship him. Let's make vows to him. Let's make sacrifices to him. I mean, so God redeemed Jonah's rebellion to actually lead people to him. So your story continues as well. Right now, you're in the midst of your story. We're looking at Jonah's story, but you're living your story. And, and, and I don't know uh, where you are in that story. I don't know if you've heard from God, if you've been running from God. I don't know if, you know, you're in the storm. Uh, I don't know if right now you feel like you're in the belly of a fish. But the question I want to leave you with tonight is what direction are you running? What direction are you running? Are you running toward God and his life and his mission and his calling? Or are you running away? Because he's calling you to follow him. Will you pray with me?